Hi class, well welcome to the next reading section. We're right in the middle of the contest of the bow. Odysseus has just asked to try on the bow and um, everyone is basically uh, indignant. They're, they don't want him to do this, but uh, we'll go ahead and start right here. We're gonna start right here at line 285. And so he spoke, uh, well, this is um, Odysseus who just spoken, but all of them were wildly indignant and feared that he might take the well-polished bow and string it. But Antinous, one of the suitors, right, scolded him and spoke out and named him. Ah, wretched stranger at this point. Remember, they don't remember, they don't know who Odysseus is at the time. He's still in disguise. You have no sense, not even a little. It is not a knife enough that you dine in peace among us who are violent men and are deprived of no fair portion but listen to but listen to our conversation what we say but there's a no other vagabond and a newcomer who is allowed to hear us talk in other words what he's saying here is that just sit and listen that is even a privilege Right, because he's saying uh, what he says here is that you are deprived, and we are deprived of more fair portion. He's basically also saying we are better than you. There, the honeyed wine has hurt you. You're drunk. It has distracted the others well, who gulp it down without drinking season. It was it was also wine that drove Centaur, the famous Centaur, the, the famous Eurasian, Eurasian, to distracted in the palace of the great-hearted Perinthios. When he visited Lapiths, his brain went wild with drinking. And in his fury, he did much harm in the house of Prithios. Grief and rage then seized the heroes. They sprang up and dragged him through the forecar. Car, oh, sorry, by the way, I need to put down here that uh, this is Antinoa spoke uh, speaking. And what he's speaking... Okay, he's gonna tell a little story like we often get in the Odyssey and the Iliad. So this is a little story that's on the side. Grief and rage sees the heroes. They sprang up and dragged him through the forecourt and the outside with the pillars bronze severing his ears and nose. And he, having his brains bewildered, knew what a disaster his unstable spirit had got him. Since his time, there's been a feud between men and centaurs, and he was the first who found his own evil and heavy drinking. So I announce the great trouble for you as well. If ever you string the bow, you will meet no kind of courtesy in our group. But we shall put you onto a black ship and take you over to team. King Akitos, one who mutilates all men, where you will lose everything and sit and be quiet, sit and be quiet and drink your wine. And no quarrel with men who are younger than you are. In other words, uh, we'll put you on a slave ship, okay, and you're gonna go to a bad place. So basically, this is a threat, okay. We will sell you as. A slave. Be quiet. Right? And this is the end of his speech. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Antonos, this is Penelope speaking. It is neither fair nor just to browbeat any guest of Telemachus who comes to visit him. Do you imagine that this stranger in confidence of hands and strength should bring the bow of Odysseus? That he would take me home with him to be his wife? In other words, she's saying, listen, even if he could string the bow, do you think he's going to get to marry me? No. He himself has no such thought on the heart with him. Though, uh, actually, he does. That's funny. Let none of you be sorrowful at heart and is feasting here for such reason. There is no likelihood of it. In other words, what's the harm? What's the harm, guys? What's this guy going to do? You think he's going to marry me? No. And now your Makos, here's the other main suitor, the son of Polybos, answered, Daughter of Icarus, circumstance Penelope, we do not think he will take you away. That is not likely. 
But we are ashamed to face the talk of the men and the women, for some fear another Achaean, who is meaner than they are, might say, Far baser men are courting the wife of a stately man. They are not even able to string the bow. Then another, some beggar man, came wandering in from somewhere, and easily strung the bow and sent a shaft of the iron. So they will speak, and will be a disgrace for all of us. In other words, the suitors don't want to look bad. Which makes sense, right? It would look bad if they weren't able to string the bow and send the arrow through the irons, but some other a beggar came in and did it. That would definitely look bad. Circumstance, Penelope said to him an answer. Here's Penelope speaking. So that's that's E speaking here. Your Marcos, there can be no glory among our people in any case for those who eat away and dishonor the house of great man. Why be concerned over reproaches? <laughs> Uh, but this stranger is a very big man. He's built strongly. He also claims to be son of a noble father. Um, what's funny here is basically like you don't look good. Anyways, right? You're eating all my stuff. You've kind of already, um, you already kind of have no honor. <laughs> I'm going to pause real quick and we'll go to the next page. All right, Penelope's continue to speak, speak here. Come then, give him the polished bow. Let us see what happens, for I'll tell you straight out and it will be a thing accomplished. If he can string the bow, and if Apollo gives him that glory, I will give him fine clothing to wear, a mantle tunic, give him a sharp javelin to keep the men and the dogs up, and give him sandals for his feet, a sword of two edges, and send him wherever his heart and spirit be sent. So Penelope's kind of turning this on his head. Instead of making this something about marrying her, she's Penelope offers prizes if O can string bow. Now, what this does is it allows the suitors to kind of say, okay, this is a separate contest for the for the for Odysseus, the beggar, they they think he is. So it kind of takes away some of the pressure off them of of the bow. So that's kind of what's going on here. Then thoughtful Telemachus said to her an answer. My mother, no Achaean man has more authority over this bow than I, to give or withhold at my pleasure. Not one of these who are lords here in Rocky Ithaca, not one of those in the islands off horse pasturing Elis. No one can force against my will if I want uh, me against my will. If I want, I can give it to the stranger. This is great. No one, look how much uh, Telemachus has grown. No one can force me against my will if I want. I can give it to a stranger as an outright gift to take away with him. Go, therefore, back into the house and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff, and see to it that your handmaidens ply the work, and also the men shall the bone they're keeping all men, but I most of all for mine is the power in this household. Now, a couple of things happening here. First of all, Telemachus is becoming more of a man. We see a little bit of sexism here, which is unfortunate, but that's that's kind of how it was back in the day. And this is this would have been seen as a positive thing. Telemachus asserts his ownership of house and bow. Which is not something that he would have done early in the story. So we see growth of Telemachus here. And that's why this next part says, Penelope went into the house in amazement, for she laid the serious words in her heart, deep away in her spirit. And, and she went to back to the upper story with her tenant and wept for Odysseus. I think, this is just me, um, that Telemachus reminded her of her husband Odysseus here in his forcefulness and his confidence. And so she wept for Odysseus until her beloved husband, great Athena, cast sweet slumber on her eyelid. Now the noble swineherd, Eumaeus, took the curved bow and carried it, but all the suitors in the palace cried out against him, and thus go to the, thus would go to the word against one of the arrogant young men. So here's the suitors. Where are you carrying the bow, you sorry and shiftless swineherd? So the swineherd is carrying the bow. Eumaeus. bow these swift dogs that you raise for yourself will feed you beside your pigs forsaken of only by apollo and the rest of the immortal gods are propitious towards us 
Propitious means that they are um, they have favor towards us. Okay, if only they would give favor towards us. They spoke, and he took. They spoke, and he took the bow and put it back where it had been in fear, since many men were shouting at him in the palace. But from the other side, Telemachus spoke and threatened them. Keep on the bow, old fellow. So here's Telemachus speaking. You cannot do what everyone tells you. Take care, or younger than I am, I might chase. Younger though I am, I might chase you out of the fields with a shower of stones. I'm stronger than you are. I only wish I were as. I only wish I were as much stronger and more of a fighter with my hands than all these suitors who are in my household, so I could hatefully speed any man of them on his journey. <laughs> Um, out of our house where they are contriving evils against us. This is Telemachus speaking. So he's like, hey, I wish I could chase the suitors out, but keep going with the bow. So he spoke, and all the suitors laughed happily at him. So this is actually seen as more funny, it seems. Funny? Sorry, if I can spell right. Uh, where's my eraser? Uh, it seems to be funny. Is it funny? And all gave over their bitter rage against Telemachus. The swineherd took up the bow and carried it to the palace and stood by wise Odysseus and handed it to him. And he called aside the nurse Eurycleia and told her. Circumspect Eurycleia, Telemachus wants you to bar the tightly fitted doors that close the house, and then if you hear any. If you hear from inside the crash and outcry of men who are caught within our toils, you must not peep from the outside, but simply sit still your work in silence. So, lock the doors. Ignore any screams. Ooh, we are about there. So he spoke. And she had no winged words for an answer. Eurycleia barred the doors of the strong-built great hall. Philiotus sprang to his feet and went silently outside the house. And then he closed the doors of the well-made courtyard. So they are trapping the suitors in. Lying beneath the por por portico was a fiber caper for an oar-driven ship. And with that he made fast the doors. And he himself went in and sat on the chair from which he had risen looking towards Odysseus, who by now was handling the bow, turning it all up and down, and testing it from one side of the other to see if the worms had eaten the horn in the master's absence. And thus one of them would say as he looked across the next man. This is just a general saying. This is supposed to show what Odysseus looked like. Okay. This is a man. This man is an admirer of bows, or or one who steals them. He's looking at really close. Does he admire them, or is he going to steal them? Now, either he has such things lying back way in his own house, or else he's stunning to make one. The way he turns it this way and that, and our vag our vagabond who's this her vagabond who's versed in villainies. How's that? That how's that for consonants? That's where you have the same letter. Our vagabond who's versed in villainies. I love that. And thus he would speak to another man of these arrogant young men, how I wish his share of good fortune were the same measure as the degree of his power ever to get this bow strong. All right. In other words, I wish his luck is the same as his dealing. the bow so the suitors talked but now resourceful Odysseus once he had taken up the great bow and looked it over as when a man who understands the lyre and singing easily holding it on either sides pulls a strong twisted cord of sheep's gut so as to slip it over a new peg so without any strain right so this is all here telling you that this is it's just easy for him Shoop. Odysseus strung the great bow the next couple exclamation points here. He strings the rainbow that nobody else can do. Then plucking it in his right hand, he tested the string. 
and it gave back to him this excellent sound like the voice of a swallow. I love this part. The bow, I'm just going to say the bow sings. A great sorrow now fell upon the suitors, and their color changed. And note this, Zeus showing forth with his portents, his sign thundered mightily. So you got to imagine, the bow sings, ting. The suitors are like, oh, man. They don't know they're dead yet. And you can imagine Zeus, whether it's figurative or literal, thunder going on. Okay, this is this is happening. This is the moment. Hearing this, long-suffering great Odysseus was happy that the son of Devious devising Cronus had sent him a portent, a sign. So I think thunder really did go off. He chose a swift arrow that lay beside him uncovered on the table. But the others were still stored up inside the hollow quiver. And presently the Achaeans must, must learn their nature. Okay, so there's one out and a few in. Taking the string and the head grooves, he drew to the middle grip. And from the very chair where he sat, bending the bow before him, let the arrow fly. Nor missed any axis from the first hand of land, but the bronze-weighted arrow pass through all to the other end. So he shoots, arrow, through, axis. He spoke to Telemachus. Telemachus, your guest that sits in your hall, hall does not fail you. This is Odysseus. I miss no part of the mark, nor have I made much work of string the bow. The strength is still sound with me. And not as the suitors said in their scorn, making little of me. Now is the time for the dinner to be to dinner to be served the canes in the daylight. Then follow with the entertainment, the dance and the lyre. For these things come with the feasting. Note here, this is he's calling this entertainment. Um Yes, there will be entertainment. Not the entertainment that the suitors are thinking. He spoke and nodded to him with his brows, and Telemachus, the son of great law, got like it, it is, put his sharp sword about him and closed his hand over his spear and took his position close beside him next to, next to the chair, all armed in bright bonds. All right, this is the end of the chapter. We set this up. The bow, the arrows through. The axes, um, Odysseus hints at uh, entertainment, and we're going to jump straight into the next section right here. All right. Now resourceful Odysseus stripped his rags from him and sprang atop the great household, holding his bow and quiver filled with arrows and scattered out the shifts, swift shafts before him. So he, he basically pours out arrows. Why? So he can get at them easier. On the ground next to his feet, and he spoke to the suitors. Here is a task that's been achieved without any deception. Now I shoot at another mark, one that no man yet has struck, if I can hit it, and Apollo grants me real glory. He spoke and steered a bitter arrow against Antinous. Now note here that Antinous dies first. Um, he is the meanest suitor. I think that's why. Um, I could be wrong, but I would imagine that's why he gets to die first. He was at, so you can almost imagine the picture here. Imagine this in your picture as I, in your head as I read it. He was at the point of lifting up a fine two-handled goblet of gold, and he had it in his hands and was moving it so as to drink the rind, and in his heart there was no thought of death. For, the, for who would think that one man, alone in a company of many men at their feasting, though he were a very strong one, would ever inflict death upon him in dark doom. But Odysseus, aiming at this man, struck him in the throat with an arrow, and clean through the soft part of the neck the point was driven. He slumped away to one side, and out of his stricken hand fell the goblet. Up through his nostrils but there burst a thick jet of mortal blood, and with a thrust of his foot he kicked back the table from him, so that all the good food was scattered on the ground, bread and baked meats together. Okay, so, oh, shoots Antinous through the neck. Uh, 
Note here that the suitors aren't going to realize what's happening quite yet. But all the suitors clamored about the house when they saw the man fall and sprang up from the seats and ranged about the room, throwing their glances every way among the well built walls. But there was never a shield nor a strong spear for them. But they scolded Odysseus in words full of, in words full of anger, saying, these are the suitors, Stranger, it is badly done to hit men. You will never achieve any more trials. Now, now your sudden destruction is certain, for if you have struck down a man who is by far the greatest, the youth of I Ithaca, for the vultures shall eat you. So they're mad, obviously. Suitors are mad. But, note here, they still don't know that he did it on purpose. Each sp spoke at random, for they thought he had not intended to kill the man. Poor fools. And they had not yet realized how over all of them the terms of death were now hanging. Okay? So the suitors think O killed A by accident. But looking darkly upon them, resourceful Odysseus answered, You dogs! You never thought I would would any more come back from the land of Troy. And because of you, you despoiled, you spoiled, you ruined my household and forcibly took my serving woman to sleep beside you. Why am I circling that? I do not know. To sleep beside you. And sought to win my wife while I was still alive, fearing neither the immortal gods who hold the wide heaven, nor any resentment sprung from men to be yours in the future. Now upon all of you, the terms of destruction are fastened. Okay. O reveals himself right here. He doesn't say I'm Odysseus, but he says it because he says you took over my house, you made my serving woman sleep beside you, and you even tried to marry my wife. It is clear who he is right here. So he spoke, and in green fear, and green fear took all of them, and each man looked about him to, for a way to escape sheer death. Oni, Eurymachus, spoke up and gave him a an answer. If in truth you are Odysseus of, Ith of Ithaca, come home. What you have said is fair about the wickedness done to you by, by the Achaeans, much in your house and much in the country. But now the man is down who is responsible for all of this, and to know us. He is one who pushed for action, not, much that he, not so much that he wanted the marriage or cared for it, but the other things in mind which the son of Cronos would not grant him, to lie and wait for your son and kill him, here's the things he did, and to be king himself in the district the strong found at Ithaca. Now he has perished by his own fate. Then spare your own people, and afterward we will make public reparation for all that has been eaten and drunk in your halls, setting upon each upon himself the assessment of twenty oxen. We will pay it back in bronze and gold to you until your heart is softened. Till then, we cannot blame you for being angry. Now, now your Marcos actually makes a good suggestion, in my opinion. He suggests repayment. But here's the deal. You think Odysseus is going to accept this after everything they've done? I mean, that'd be a really lousy way to end the book. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Pay me back. <laughs> so, no, of course. Then looking darkly at him, resourceful Odysseus answered. This is this is E speaking here. And this is Odysseus speaking here. Ear Marcos, if you gave me all your father's possessions, all that you have now, and all the cows from Ezra, even so, I would not stay my hands from slaughter. Until I had revenge taken for all the suitors' transgression. Now, the choice has been set before you, either to fight me or run. And if any of you can escape death and its spirits. But I think not one man will escape from sheer destruction. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of um, the response that Achilleus, right? This is like Achilleus' response to Agamemnon. Right? Even though it seems reasonable. Hey, we'll pay you back. Okay, no, he's angry. And there, I think there's a simile, there, there's, there's a comparison we can make here between these things. That they're angry, they're not going to let this go. 
So he spoke, and the other's knees and the heart within them went slack. That means their, their, their hearts fell. But Eurymachos cried a second time to the suitors. Dear friends, now this man will not restrain his invincible hands, but, but since he's got the polished bro with quiver, he will shoot at us from the smooth threshold until he's killed us one and all. Then let us remember our warcraft. Draw your swords and hold the table before you to ward off the arrows of sudden death. Let us make a rush against him together and try to push him back from the doors and the threshold and, and go through the town. So the hue and the cry must be most quickly raised, and perhaps this man will have shot for the last time. So your Marcos basically says, all right, guys, remember, you're soldiers. We can do this. So he spoke aloud and drew from his side the sharp sword, brazen and brazen and edged on either side, and made a rush at him, crying his, t his terrible cry. But at the same time, noble Odysseus shot an arrow and struck him in the chest by the nipple, and the speeding arrow fixed in his level, and his sword tumbled out of his hands on the floor, and he sprawled over the table, doubled and fell, and on the floor the good food was scattered in the two-handled goblet. <laughs> the goblet's back again, and he struck the ground with his forehead in a paroxysm of pain, and kicking with both feet, rattled the chair, and over his eyes the death mist drifted. Hey, we have another good death sequence there. We get a few of these in these books. Just a note that paroxysm is an interesting word here. Uh, paroxysm is like the sudden worsening of symptoms. I guess if you got a, um, his forehead had a sudden worsening of symptoms. It's an interesting word here to describe how, what he felt when his forehead hit the ground. Amphonimos, springing forward to face glorious Odysseus, made a rush against him and drew his sharp sword, thinking that he might be forced to give way from the doors. But now Telemachus was too quick with cast with a cast of the brazen spear from behind him between the shoulders and it drove it through his chest beyond it. He fell thunderously and took the earth full on his forehead. Telemachus sprang away and left behind the far-shadowing spear where it was, where it was in Amphimus, turning back for fear that as he pulled out the far-shadowing fear, some other Achaean would, might drive at him with an onrush or strike him from close up. He went on the run... And very soon he reached his dear father and stood there close to him and addressed him in wooden words. So, T spears a man and runs. So he's not grown up yet because uh, he should have pulled the spear out. Because the spear, remember, is the better weapon. And he's leaving a spear for the suitors. Okay? So this was a mistake. He says... Father, I will now go and bring you a shield and two spears and a helmet of all bronze fitting close to your temple. So at least he's going to go help Odysseus. I will go and put on armor and give the swineherd and oxherd more to wear. It is better for us to be armored. Then in turn, resourceful Odysseus spoke to him in answer, Run and fetch them to me. Oh, sorry. Uh... Let me get back here. Run and fetch them for me. Um, gosh, I'm having troubles. There we go. Well, I have arrows still to fend me, or else while I'm alone, they might force me out of the doorway. And so he spoke, and Telemachus obeyed his dear father, and went on his way to the inner room, where the glorious armor was stored away, and took from inside four shields and eight spears, and four helmets plated with bronze and crested with horse hair. And carried them back, and very soon he reached his dear father. He was the first of all to put bronze armor upon him. And in the same way, the two serving men put on their magnificent arms and stood beside the wise, resourceful Odysseus. Odysseus, while he still had arrows left to defend him, kept aiming at the suitors of his house. And every time he hit his man, they dropped one after the other. And we're going to stop right there. Uh, we'll pick that up. Um, we're going to continue with the battle at, on the next reading.